Hi everyone, it's Dr. Romani and welcome back to this YouTube channel that takes on all kinds of issues related to narcissism, narcissistic relationships, and just coming out of the haze of narcissistic abuse. Today, again, this is something that was driven by um, questions and comments that people had, which is this, this unique element of attempting to recover from narcissistic abuse, which is how do you recover from the lie? Sometimes even feeling like you lived a double life. So let's talk about that. So when we think about the grief of the narcissistic relationship, there are lots of things that people are grieving. They're grieving the actual relationship. They may be grieving never having had a normal childhood, grieving that belief in happy endings, grieving that they won't be able to give their child that intact family, grieving getting divorced when you vowed you would never let that happen. It's not just the simple stuff like the loss of a marriage or the death of a loved one. It's very nuanced grief. But the one barrier that really complicates narcissistic grief is having to recover from the lies, from the fiction. When people slowly decide to detach from a narcissistic relationship and then actually go through the rigors of getting out of a narcissistic relationship, they are exhausted because the d divorces are messy and contentious. The family disapproval is strong. Finding a new job is difficult. Being ostracized from a group of friends is painful. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship you are trying to exit. It is very, very difficult. But the peace around lying and the lies you were told and recovering from those lies is a different kind of grief and recovery. After the initial dust settles, people look back and start feeling like they were in a black mirror episode and ask themselves, was any of that real? Was that, did that relationship, what, did, what would just happen? And as the lies get unearthed, when you recognize that a partner actually had been texting their lover during your birthday party, or your parent did not share lies that if you had known the truth, you have, would have changed major life decisions you made or changed things that affected the course of your life. That your partner chose to stay married to you because it was financially more expedient than getting a divorce and they didn't stay because they loved you. That all of the future fakes were fake and all of those promised things never came to fruition and were never going to happen. You were never going to do the things they married like move closer to family or have the support to go back to school or take a vacation or have kids. And now it's too late to address many of those things. So not only is it the grief of the lies, meaning you didn't or couldn't do some things, but the confusion about what was actually real in your life. It can leave people in a ruminating fog, staring at old photographs and wondering, I was smiling, but now I know it was a lie. Was I happy? Were they happy? What just happened to me and what just happened in my life? When working with survivors, I often encourage them to divide things into different categories, episodes, contexts, and feelings. When people ask themselves, was my life real? It can be really challenging because yeah, it was as real as anything is, but the issue is not whether those things happen, but it's the interpretation and perception of those events that's getting challenged. So the question is not, when you look at the pictures, did we go to Italy? Obviously, yes, you did. You have the pictures of you standing in front of the Tower of Pisa or the yellowed boarding pass stub or the earrings you bought at a flea market. Yes, you were there. So that part was real. Yes, you did go to Italy. Yes, you did go to that restaurant or stayed in that hotel or whatever it was you did. That real part is the episode. The episode happened. But then... When you look at that smile and look at that photo and you're both smiling big and then you do the math and recognize, for example, that perhaps your partner's affair was actually happening at that time. You're, you just didn't know it at the time. It doesn't take away the episode. You, in fact, did get on a plane and go to Italy. 
but it changes the context. You were actually in Italy with a person who was thinking about and communicating with someone else. The trip, the physical trip was real, but the circumstances were not what you thought. And that shift in context can really do a number on your mind. Fact is the people were smiling in the picture. We don't know actually though why. Then there is the feeling part. You believed you had gone to Italy with a loving partner, maybe to address a rough patch in the relationship or take your first trip together in years. That smiling picture, you recall being happy that day. Was your partner happy that day? Who the hell knows? Maybe they were. Maybe they were actually happy having a nice time in Italy with you because it's beautiful. And they were bolstered by whatever additional narcissistic supply their affair was giving them. Maybe they weren't happy. Maybe it was a white knuckle trip for them and they had planned to divorce you. So they were smiling through gritted teeth. And the feeling part is the part that really does a number on your grief and recovery because you perceived a truth that your partner, just like in that picture with that big smile was all in or they were happy. You see that smiling picture? But in fact, it wasn't what you thought. A narcissistic relationship involves years, if not lifetimes of wishful thinking and all of that wishful thinking being drawn and rendered into a relationship. Basically, all of those justifications and hopes and beliefs in future faked promises becoming a sort of picture you have drawn of the relationship you want, the relationship you hope for, the relationship you wanted to believe in. When the lies slowly reveal themselves, the justifications are shown for what they are, and it is devastating. The cognitive dissonance, the trauma bond, all of that, the whole thing confuses you and leaves you really, conf really confused. A key element to narcissistic grief is rumination. You ruminate about the lies and why didn't I see any of this? Why didn't I leave when I saw the lies? And why didn't the people who knew about the lies say something to me? And you just play that loop over and over again. And then people who are caught in these relationships become really self-disparaging. You say things to yourself like, why was I so stupid? Why did I fall for it? Why didn't I believe the people who actually did tell me? Because we all fall for it. Cognitive dissonance is real and we break it by making that picture to be what we want. We also put the focus on ourselves. We focus on doing everything we can to make the relationship look the way we want and blame ourselves for not being perfect when it doesn't work. We put together the holidays, we put together the vacations, we put it together so we can convince ourselves I'm in a good relationship. It is traumatic to feel that you were living a sort of double life. You see the truth of it now, but while you were in it, could not imagine that it was that. When I talk to long-term survivors, the rumination really takes a toll and draws them into their own heads. They think of their younger selves who still believed in all of it, who tried so hard, and they almost feel a sense of pity for that younger, seemingly naive person. Perhaps the grief is the loss of that younger self, of, or of the exhaustion of their hope in the unavailable and rejecting partner, parent, friend, whoever it was. This area of understanding narcissistic abuse is just now evolving. Their younger selves, we're just understanding narcissistic abuse now, so their younger selves would not have been able to find a therapist who would have actually gotten it. So there was no way to get to see the light. The rumination isn't just about the lies, but also about if I had known then what I know now, if I had known what their behavior was about, I would not have spent so many years feeling crazy. It's also a rumination about spending time in a circumstance made harder by not knowing and self-blame. And then there is a period of time when a person looks back at what has happened in their narcissistic relationship and then is able to explain the episodes that made no sense at the time. The clarity, while potentially liberating, 
it's almost like breaking a code. It can leave a person working backwards to make sense of what just happened, but also feeling as though they are grieving for the hopeful person they once were, who was futilely waiting for change. Of all of the grief and recovery and harm patterns of narcissistic abuse, rumination is often cited as one of the most disruptive. It leads people to feel zoned out, stuck in the past. I often say, let it out, which is why therapy is so important. A good therapist will let you keep letting it out. And at some point, almost all of it will come out, but sharing it and bringing it into the light can help end the cycles and provide a validating and new perspective as well. In a way, the rumination can be a process of letting go and clearing space for the healthier stuff that will come. But please be patient with yourself. These things take time. There is really no, very few things that feel as bad as being duped. And when your life feels like it was one big dupe, you will often go back and play those episodes, but see them within new contexts and recognize that the feelings were not what you thought. Thanks again.